Hi everyone, we're gonna get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Rachel Parada and I'm a junior here at Vanderbilt University. I serve as the editor-in-chief of the Vanderbilt Hustler, which is Vanderbilt's official student newspaper. And so to start off, I wanna highlight one of our commitment to action and want to invite to the stage Ellie Armstrong of Vanderbilt University and Gina Yu of Vanderbilt University. And so these students are tackling the challenge of how cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death for men, women, and people of most racial and ethnic groups in the United States, accounting for one death of every 34 seconds. While food organizations, free health screenings, and advancements in medicine all help people with cardiovascular disease, access to information about daily health management is lacking. And so these students are attempting to address this problem by creating Heart to Heart, a text message based program for chronic management of cardiovascular disease. Friendly text reminders are sent to at risk and low income patients to promote positive and sustainable health engagement. Outreach will primarily target low income neighborhoods in metropolitan areas to improve medication adherence, healthy behaviors and healthy outcomes. The program is scalable and accessible to anyone with a smartphone. And so these students are partnering with healthcare, food, and education nonprofits to help develop tailored content based on individual users' needs. And they hope to, future, uh, to expand this program in the future, um, maybe with clients of food insecurity organizations, refugee institutions, schools, retirement homes, and the general public. And so now I'd like to present these two students with their certificates. So now I'd like to call to the stage our speakers for this event. And so our first speaker is Larissa May, who is the founder and executive director of Half the Story and also a Vanderbilt alumni. Our second speaker is Joelle Burvell, who is a CGIU um, alum of 2018. He is a social media med medical educator and is a fourth year medical student at Washington State University. Yeah. And our final speaker for this event is Abe Lopez, who is a CGIU alum from 2012, and he is a managing partner of Light Ward. Thank you guys all for being here today and speaking to our, our audience, and so I just want to start off with asking you guys to briefly introduce yourself in one to two minutes, what you do, why you're here, what you're passionate about. My name is Larissa May, and as you mentioned, I actually gradu graduated from Vanderbilt University in 2016, so this moment means the world to me. I stand here today as a survivor. Seven years ago, I almost ended my own life on this very campus due to my struggles with depression, in the digital world. So I made it my mission at that critical turning point as a student to be a part of the future and shift and build a world where youth would have an agency over their devices and their emotional health. So today I stand here proudly with my family and my team members who are actually Vanderbilt graduate and undergraduate students. As the founder and digital well-being activist of an organization called Half the Story. We were the first organization founded by youth at the intersection of emotional health and technology, and we've built policies and intervention-backed education programs that we're scaling around the United States and UK. That's incredible. Thank you for all you do. Hey, everyone. My name is Joel Burvell. I'm a fourth-year medical student at Washington State University, um, but I'm currently doing a research here at Johns Hopkins on Lyme, and better known as the medical mythbuster, for creating content about healthcare disparities, um, the overlooked uh, aspects of medicine that we don't often talk about, and the ways that medicine needs to change to be more equitable for all systems. So my journey really started about, I'd say, three years ago, 
when I was sitting in medical school, and we kept talking about skin conditions, but not showing what they looked like on darker skin. And there was one time where we were talking about cyanosis, which is when the skin can turn blue. And my, the, the doctor that I was talking kept saying, oh yeah, cyanosis, look for blue skin, that's when you can understand what's happening to the patient. And I kept looking at myself and saying, I'm not gonna be turning blue, what's gonna happen to someone that looks like me? And I wasn't sure if I should ask the question, but I ended up raising my hand, asking a professor, and he had a great answer. He said, you can look at your mucous membranes, you can look at your um, eye beds, there's all these different ways to look at it. But I kept asking myself, if I hadn't asked the question, who would have asked it if I wasn't there? And at my medical school, I was in the first cohort of black students. Um, so there's no other black students before me. And I keep thinking about how many opportunities were lost like that. So I ended up doing what I think most people in our generation would do now. I made a TikTok about it. Um, and it ended up going viral. And I realized there's an opportunity to talk about the overlooked aspects of medicine where there's so many things that need to change, whether it's talking about skin tone or talking about race-based medicine that's still used today but doesn't make sense, um, and figuring out how do we educate the public so we can understand what should and shouldn't be taught in medical schools. Hey everyone, thanks for coming out today. My name is Abe Lopez. I'm a managing partner at uh, a global uh, enterprise that deals with technology and creative projects. Um, I'm also a very joyful person, and I share that journey online. I'm a photographer, a plus-size model, and a health advocate. Um, I started sharing my story on social media six years ago when I started uh, a hashtag called Abe Minus 100. I was living in chronic pain uh, where I couldn't walk or do mostly anything without extreme pain. I couldn't wash dishes, I couldn't stand up. Every step that I took, um, I was in excruciating pain. And I started sharing that on my uh, Instagram, um, just in a vulnerable attempt uh, to show people that living with chronic pain um, is hard. And I started doing that and uh, the, I created a hashtag called A-100 and I started sharing my journey to become a more healthy, holistic person. Um, and since then, um, I've been a health advocate sharing my story very vulnerably online uh, for the last six years. And it's inspired people to uh, take advantage of all that the world has to offer in terms of uh, taking uh, care of yourself in a myriad of ways. Um, and that is one of my passions today, so that's why I'm excited to be here. Thank you all for that brief introduction. And so you all kind of talked about how you have different types of uh, presence online on social media. And I know that creating and sustaining that presence can be very overwhelming, very time consuming. And so what advice do you have for those who are just starting to put their ideas into action and how do you manage those pressures? Why don't you take it? <laughs> yeah, um, so I, I talk a lot about how do you build a personal brand that's authentic. I think the more you're able to, to build something that is true to who you are, the less it feels like work. And so when it comes to social media, it should be an extension of yourself. It shouldn't be something different that you're putting out there. It should be who you are already. So I always advise people to think about what are the things you are, you're already passionate about, the things that you can't stop thinking about. And I think for all of you here that have a commitment, that's your kind of North Star that you should be looking at. What is it that's guiding you and driving you, and what's the core of that? Once you figure what, out what that is, you start finding other people who are also within that same realm. You can follow them on social media, you can read their blog posts, you can watch their speeches or talks that they've given, and you can find and distill down what your idea is and start kind of really um, kind of narrowing and focusing on that. Um, so I always say that it can be really hard putting stuff on social media, but the closer it's aligned to the things you already care about, the things you already are talking about every single day, talk, to, talk on social media like you're talking to a friend or you're explaining your idea or your commitment um, to whoever it is that you want to know, and I think it makes it a lot, a lot easier. Thank you for sharing that. I firmly believe that stories have the power to change the world, and when I was a student in my darkest moments here, storytelling was a way that I coped with my battle with depression, and the digital world was a way that that story touched millions of people around the world. And I remember sitting in my dorm room right over in Branscombe and thinking about what is it about social media that we aren't talking about? And it was the idea that social media is only half of the story, which is where I started by sharing my own. And through that journey, I learned three critical skills. One is that ideas, ideas that last change hearts, not just minds. The second is you need to get an advocate in your corner. 
As a student, it can be very overwhelming to build a business, to create content on top of everything else that you have on your plate. So what I did is I found a professor that would vouch for me and give me a small grant as a student and allow half the story to serve as a course so that the project that I had could benefit myself personally, professionally, as well as in the school ecosystem. And the third thing I learned is the importance of understanding active versus passive screen time consumption, which is something that we focus on in our intervention work. Not all screen time is created equal. When you're actively engaging or storytelling, that can be a positive way to use technology. But if you're so focused on how people are responding to you and you're getting lost in the rabbit hole, it takes you away from that mission and sometimes yourself. So it's important to get right and get fit within before you start translating that story onto these digital platforms so that you can feel empowered, that you can motivate others, and that you can build something that stands the test of time seven years later. And I'm not stopping now. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, so just kind of um, with these media presence and with the overwhelming nature that they can you know, impose on you, um, how do you manage that and how do you do so in a way that is able to affect other people? I think this kind of relates to my whole journey in health. A lot of people talk about um, people getting on a weight loss journey like I have and um, reverting back to old habits or something. And I think a, a key tenant to my success over the last six years in one, my health journey period, because that a whole life transformation is actually really hard. Um, so giving myself the time and space to learn about the things that make me pumped up to continue the journey is really important. But two, I think another tenant that has helped me um, is approaching my uh, strategy with the key word of sustainability at the front of my mind. Um, it is easy to burn out right now. There are so many things happening in the world. You're getting so much information thrown at you every second that you opt into it. And I think that um, you really need to ask yourself the critical hard questions of, is, is my approach sustainable? Can I see myself doing this in four years? If not, that's fine. But if you can um, be honest with yourself in your approach, then I feel like um, you will have kind of a regenerative uh, approach that kind of sustains the long haul uh, journey. Can I ask a follow-up question yeah. to you two? So one of the greatest challenges I think that youth find is this digital overwhelm. There's TikTok, there's Be Real, there's Twitter. I know that I started with Instagram, but what platforms did you all start with and own? Because it can be very overwhelming when you feel like you need to be everywhere. And I'd love to just get your, your perspectives as well as yours. Yeah, I started, I'm old. Um, I started at Facebook. Um, and I really just was a person that started sharing my life before Abe minus 100. Um, and when Instagram started, um, I started uh, approaching that as a really good uh, platform to share because of the hashtags. Um, now hashtags aren't as uh, helpful, um, unfortunately, but um, yeah, I transferred from Facebook to Instagram. Yeah, and for me, um, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm in this weird kind of generation, so I'm a millennial, but also Gen Z, so I call myself a millennial. I don't know if I'm stealing that word or whatever, but um, uh, I, so I feel like I was using Facebook. Like I remember growing up using Facebook, and I used to post these quotes when I was in high school that I thought were really funny. So there's one that was like, um, like you name your iPod Titanic, you plug it in, it says Titanic is sinking, and you like pull it out and you save your iPhone from sinking the Titanic. <laughs> uh, but I did little stupid, stupid things like that. And when Instagram came along, I started sharing my journey in medicine. Um, and just like as an undergrad, what it was like. But it wasn't until TikTok that it really took off. Um, and I started off on TikTok actually by talking about my journey going to an undergrad, an Ivy League um, institution, how I got, I paid my own way through through college with scholarships. And so scholarships that I got in, I think the first video that got a million views for me was a video that just talked about five scholarships that I got in and applied to in high school and like the benefits that you can get from that. And then I started going on kind of back to Instagram and taking the TikTok model of short form content onto there. But the way I try and minimize the amount of work, because it does get overwhelming. I hate having like to look at my Twitter and then my LinkedIn and then my TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and everything. Um, and I think figuring out how do you like minimize the content you're creating to be able to live on all these platforms has been huge. And so short form content is nice now because I can make a video on TikTok, screen record it and post it everywhere. Um, and now that Shorts is out, you can post it on YouTube Shorts as well. So that really helps out with kind of managing, but it does get overwhelming. And I always encourage people to, f to kind of focus on one platform at first, master that before you go on to the different ones. 
And the importance of that is because you build a following in one area, and you also figure out the differences between that platform versus another. So on TikTok, I post some things I don't post on Instagram, and vice versa, and using their tools in very different ways to approach different audiences. And go ahead. You can clap. That was a great answer. <laughs> There's a uh, really kind of famous entrepreneur, I forgot his name, but he uses his Twitter to test out his ideas of, about his content. So he has like 100,000 followers, and his Twitter feed is simply just like stating ideas out and seeing what traction that gives um, to help him uh, kind of decipher which content to make into videos. Um, so all of you guys kind of talked about how these different platforms and your different efforts on all of these platforms really corresponds to not only your personal journeys, but also to um, a greater goal of helping others. You mentioned specifically interventions. You mentioned specifically helping people who might have conditions they don't know about or helping other medical students and helping people on journeys um, similar to yours. And so, you know, how do, like, how do you create something out of your personal drive for someone else? How do you turn your words and thoughts and emotions into action like that? Well, one of the most important things to do out of the gate is to use your own journey and experience as a form of research. Research is the most important thing that you can do in any business, any project, or any idea. And it starts with yourself, testing yourself in your own journey, and interviewing other young people. Half the story started as a circle of students that I would bring together every week on Vanderbilt's campus, which then led to me speaking to young people all over the world. And I spent five years just listening and doing research until I could bring on our head of research in the back here to ultimately build a scalable solution based on what we had learned over that time period. And so I think it's important to leverage stories, regardless of where you're at in your journey, to shape and test and learn and to not be afraid of failure. We are here because we are building solutions that have not existed in human history. And it is much easier to sit up here and point out what isn't working to peers or other people, but you have to channel your intrinsic power from within and know that as a trailblazer, you're not gonna always be right, but you are gonna fight until you get to that solution so that it can scale and support young people all over the world. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that answer, and I think it's so key to really understand that first um, about your own story. Um, I think I shared a little bit of my story yesterday on stage um, on the video about my grandma um, and how she really was my drive to better understand health equity. At that point, it was from a global perspective, but as time went on, I started to realize that even here in our own communities, that someone's zip code is a better genetic indicator or a better indicator than someone's genetic code or of their health. That depending on where you live in the United States, that's gonna impact your healthcare outcomes more than whatever genes you have. And when I started learning things like that and how it impacts people, it was crazy to me that we don't often talk about it more. Um, and so whenever I create a video, I imagine I'm talking to my own family member. And a lot of my videos talk about how race is still used in medicine. So as an example, there for a long time was an equation called the GFR equation, which stands for glomerular filtration rate. GFR is a measure of how well your kidneys work. If you have a high GFR number, they work well. If you have a low GFR number, your kidneys aren't working very well. But for decades, there'd been this racial correction for GFR equations that a lot of doctors didn't even know about. And what it essentially assumed was that all black patients should have a 1.3 times multiplier added to their GFR equation, assuming that all black patients have better kidney functioning than any other race. And this was only a black versus a non-black equation. There was, I'm seeing confused looks out there, but yeah, this existed. There was a, it was a black versus a non-black equation. No other race was included. And I remember I, lear I heard about it, and I was like, what? <laughs> this makes no sense. What is it that's predisposing people to, black people specifically, to having different kidney health? And it turns out when you follow the literature, it came from this assumption that black individuals have higher levels of what's called creatinine. It's a muscle waste protein a breakdown. And so they were making the assumption that black people have greater muscle mass, so they lose more of this like creatinine protein, so let's add this 1.3 times multiplier. And the idea behind it was it was supposed to be an anti-racist effect to essentially say, let's help out people that are black to like, actually be able to kind of match it. But what ended up happening was the cohort they used was too small. And so they were making a mistake. And, what, and that led to 3.3 million black Americans to not being diagnosed with a higher stage of chronic kidney disease as they should have been. It led to black Americans not getting kidney transplants or referrals out to nephrologists when they should have gotten those referrals out. 
And so when I learned that story, I just kept thinking about my own family. I have family who has kidney problems. And so I tried to think if I was, when I created that video, how do I use 30 to 60 seconds to talk about an idea like that in a way that makes them understand it? And so for me, it's really breaking it down to the level of the family member, to someone that's never heard about a science topic and understanding how it actually impacts them and has, um, can impact their life. Wow, that's beautiful. Every data point is a story. Yeah. I think it's really important to remember our humanity in social media. I think that when I started my journey, um, I was nervous to show up and share that I was in chronic pain or show up shirtless uh, at a time that I wasn't really comfortable in my body. Actually, I had a lot of self-hate at the time. Um, and I think when you, you get quiet and you ask yourself, like, why am I doing this? And um, you also recognize that fear is an important part of the journey because it teaches you something um, and it, it shows that you care. Um, but I think moving past that fear uh, and showing up, uh, knowing that uh, we talk, the mentors talk a lot about, um, you know, you might know step one and two in your sharing your journey on social media or whatever project you're doing. Um, but you might not know what step seven or eight is. And not a lot of people talk about like when you're kind of mid, uh, mid journey. Um, and that's okay. You don't need to know how you'll show up next Tuesday. You just need to show up right now. And I think that's what inspired me to share my story. I was like, I have no idea where this is going to take me. And now, six years later, I'm in a couple advertisements for food delivery, com healthy food delivery companies in the U.S. And I didn't, if I hadn't like got quiet, if I didn't get quiet with myself and encourage myself that some people, reminded myself that some people needed to hear this in order to take advantage of their own health, then I wouldn't be here today. Thank you. Um, and, and so I know um, some of you have mentioned, especially you, Larissa, that you started your work and your advocacy when you were here at Vanderbilt. And how have you kept that mantra of youth advocacy in half the story? And what does youth advocacy mean to you? Youth voices are the most important voices in any room where a decision is being made about them. And from the time that I was 21 years old, I listened in, at the Capitol, I listened in, with CEOs of tech companies, and I realized that these adults were making decisions about the future of our mental and emotional and social health, something that we call digital well-being, without having youth voices in the room. And so from a young age, I realized that I wanted to build the first youth-led organization to ensure that we could not only identify the most important issues for youth in the digital age, but so that we could train youth like you, especially the voices that aren't heard, and bring their voices to the Capitol, to the press, and have them be at the center of the policies that are being made. Because back to what you were saying, our culture likes to study digital addiction and digital problematic use, but guess what, tech's not going anywhere. So in order to study and optimize for digital flourishing and bridge the gap between digital equity and digital well-being, youth voices need to be the most important thing that we are elevating in the space. And every day, my team here works with 40 to 100 youth that are refining our content, coming to us to the capital, and also speaking their own truth about what's affecting them in their communities. So. Youth is the future, you are the future, and I always say teamwork makes the dream work. Yeah, I couldn't say better than that. I think understanding that youth have the most powerful voices is important. You're gonna be the next generation. Um, and I keep asking myself, how long can I call myself a youth? Like, when does that like transition is it, happen? Is it like age 30? Because I'm, I'm still holding on, you oh, know? Man. I'm not 30 yet, but. I'm reaching can there, you, You're so. the doctor, you tell us. I don't know, there, you know, maybe that's a new study. There's no like, I, I what is the that. Gen Z? Well, we know, but yeah. it, it depends. It's like, it is, but. It depends, but like, I think no matter, even if you're 40 years old, you can still be a youth, you know? Youth are the future, and just understanding that when you're younger, you actually have the most power. Because I think people don't expect much of us, you know? They're like, oh, these people are still, you're in your 20s, or you're a teen still, like, you're still trying to figure things out. But when you have an idea that you latch onto, and you can inspire others around you, you have so much time to build that and to inspire others to join you on that journey. So I think remembering that as a young person, at first, I think people that are older might be like, this person doesn't, like, they're young. What do they know? But the more you stick with it, the more you show that you care about it, the more people will be impressed. And the more that you can gain and garner trust from people around you that are young and older. And exactly what you were saying, 
a lot of older people don't have young people in the room, but they're making decisions about our future. I mean, you can look at just what's happening here in Tennessee right now, right, with so many anti-LGBTQ legislation, even though a recent report came out and said that 20% of people in Gen Z identifies as LGBTQ. And I think those types of policies that affect our generation in a way that aren't affecting older generations are really important to understand and be able to advocate for. I'll just add a little snippet. Um, I really think that um, we're in a digital age where we're not just watching TV or movies. Like we are consuming things when we are waiting for the bus, when we are in between classes, when we're uh, laying in bed at night, unfortunately, which um, helps us not sleep. Um, and I think that we need to capture this moment where we need to understand like people are watching and people are consuming um, digital, uh, digital content on TikTok and various different platforms. Um, and that's how all of our ecosystems are changing just on the society level um, every day, all the time. Like what's important today might not be important tomorrow, so we need to capture like this moment right now. And I think one thing really quick, we've talked a lot about like the positive social media, and I, I think we'll probably get to some negatives too. Um, but mental health is a huge problem with social media right now. I think one of the biggest problems in our country is we do not have digital literacy. We don't teach it in schools. We're probably on our devices more than anything, more than we see other people, more than we talk to other people, et cetera. We've all gotten that Apple notification. You've been on your phone for 11 hours. Exactly, or that like TikTok scroll, like why are you still here? Get off, go outside, touch some grass. Um, but it's, it's, it's serious, and like think about it. We are on our phones so much, but have you ever learned in school about how to be digitally, digitally literate? How to look through and sources of a video and be able to tell if it's true or false. It's something that we learn on our own, but if you don't have anyone to guide you, you can learn the wrong things. There's misinformation out there, there's disinformation out there. And I think that's an opportunity for us to step in and say, how do we teach digital literacy to our peers so that we're not going down a, a negative path? Can I challenge you on that and take challenge it a step me. further? Yes. So uh, at half, in, enter half the story, but <laughs> ultimately, we believe as an organization, digital literacy is critical. However, it is not where we should stop. Digital well-being is what we are focused on, which is the intersection of our emotional health and our digital habits. So what that means is, in order to actually contribute and improve the emotional health of our youth, we have to help them understand how tech impacts their emotions rather than just focus on the technology piece. So for us, when we work in districts and schools, and hopefully we'll be all over the United States, that is my, my end goal in five years, we believe we just have to start with the emotions because the opportunity cost of technology is emotional intelligence for youth. These kids are on these devices the thing that I'm most afraid of is the digital apathy. And so we want them to feel something so that they can change something. And so that's why I always like to say, digital literacy is a part of this greater conversation of digital equity, but digital well-being is the ultimate state. It is a spectrum, it is a journey, and something that we're fighting every day to get in schools. I love that. Yeah, so you guys are, are kind of talking about how to be smart on social media, how to use technology in a way that is beneficial, in a way that helps you as a way that, as opposed to ways that can hurt you. And so what are your personal, I'm assuming, Alyssa, you might have a list of things um, that can kind of help you get toward that digital well-being, but where would you suggest that someone, maybe you know, a student in our audience, a college student, where would you suggest that they start? I did this personal experience, actually, when I was when I walked out of the PCC on Vanderbilt's campus, and I realized they asked me about every drug except for the one that was in my pocket. And so what I did is I took out my phone and I had a notebook and I captured for a week the amount of time I was spending on my device and whether it was active or passive. And what that really means is, was it mindful? Was there a purpose or was I going on it to numb something? And so before you start getting into what can I do, you need to understand what your pitfalls are. And what I learned in that space was that but I used technology when I felt less than. I used technology when I was seeking emotional support in the real world, but I couldn't get it there. So I relied on the false dopamine hits that tech gave to me. And then from there, I changed my story and I realized that mindful modifications can change your life. Small hinges can move big doors. And that looked like a couple things. It looked like one, hacking my tech. So you know, hey, Mark Zuckerberg, you're trying to hook me in, but this is what I can do. I can turn my phone in grayscale. 
I can log out of my social media account so that every time I have to think twice about whether or not I actually want to be on it. But then the third most important thing was how do I get out of the echo chamber and the algorithm that tech created for me? Because that is the thing that is most destructive socially and politically in our world. And so what I did is I actually created a completely different account so I could get out of the algorithm that was showing me beautiful woman and then suicide tips. I needed to create a new reality. And that started with taking charge and building an inspiration platform. And that was where the story started and I'm still on the journey today. There were so many gems in there. I really like the idea of like hacking technology because that's what I do right now. Um, it can be very overwhelming being on social media, getting notifications, having people want your attention at all times of the day. Um, and so one thing that I, I, I do exactly that, I turn on grayscale on my phone when I'm trying to like, not use it. My notifications, I've zeroed them on. I don't get notifications right now. And I think that's huge because we're all, always like looking for that next thing. The, the ding, as soon as it gets it, like it's, now it stresses me out. Now I'm just like, I can't have it on. Um, and so like, grayscale or like turning off notifications or just making sure that like I have someone's number or I'm calling people instead, switching up the ways I'm using social media as well. Um, right now I sit on this council called the Council for Responsible Social Media, which we need to talk. Like, Yeah, I'm like, hello, are you coming to DC with me next month? Uh, Come yeah. on. Yeah, so essentially it's a, it's a bipartisan group of policymakers, congressmen, congresswomen, um, and kind of people within the private sector space that are coming in to talk about how do we reframe digital media and understand it better for overall. So some of our main priority focuses are mental health, um, which is a big one. So there's been some cases on the Hill right now. But there's another case going on right now, Gonzalez v. Google, which is talking about whether tech companies can be sued for things that happen to people, um, whether it's around mental health crises, et cetera, for things that happen offline because of online things. I think it's gonna change the way that social media is used right now. And hopefully one of the things that comes about is transparency of these things that Larissa was talking about that tech companies right now have us in this dopamine loop of, of just checking on us, right? Um, and literally, like, if you think about it, a lot of these the tech leaders don't even let their own kids be on these phones, on their phones. Most Google's tech leader, like Facebook's, all of them, their kids don't have phones or they're not allowed to have social media. I think that says a lot when you think about it, about how negative it can be if it's not used in the right way or how it can change the way we think about ourselves or other people. There's recent studies that just came out talking about the mental health crisis and how social media is exacerbating that. Dr. Vivek Murthy, the Surgeon General, has been talking about it a lot as well. And so I think really one thing that I prioritize and try to suggest to everyone, understand the algorithm, how it's impacting you, what it's doing, how short form content impacts us, and then exactly what I said, rehack it so that you don't get impacted by that if you can. I, I also just wanted to add and give him a round of applause, but um, yes. There is so little that we know about this. The brain is the least looked at organ in the body, yet one in four Americans lives with a mental illness. And there are just studies starting to come out to show, yes, that kids that are on technology might actually be at risk for early onset dementia and Alzheimer's. This is about real cognitive shifts. This is not only just about a mental health and depression and anxiety. These devices are changing our brains and there is so little that we know about it. 20 years versus the amount of time that humanity has been around is basically a blip in the universe. I use social media for my job and it can be sometimes stressful knowing that I have to pick up my phone and use it a lot throughout the day. I think uh, three approaches that I use, one of them is to remember um, that, uh, like you were saying, our brains are not meant uh, to take in the amount of information we're taking in every day. We're just not, evolutionarily, um, humans have not uh, taken in this much information, specifically uh, in a time with so much happening uh, across the world. So I remember that. I ask myself also, am I stressed right now? How am I feeling? Like, am I going to pick up my phone and like increase my stress, increase my anxiety? Or am I in a good mood? Can I, can I ingest the war happening? Can I ingest bullying? And I ask myself honestly, and if I can't, uh, then I don't pick up my phone. Um, it, it's kind of a balancing act, though, because, again, uh, we use technology to expand our, our uh, messages, our projects, uh, run ads for different things we're doing. Um, and then also, I utilize it for uh, what it's meant to be used for, uh, connection. I don't just scroll. I have like really deep and meaningful conversations in DMs with many people from around the world, and oftentimes opens up new opportunities for me and my projects. People want to connect. We're not just here to like scroll, we're here to engage with one another. Um, so those are the three approaches I use.
Thank you. And so, Joelle, you kind of mentioned um, the role that policymakers and lawmakers can play in really fostering an environment of safe and promote uh, safe technology use in digital well-being. And so, what do you think that role is, and how can students get involved at that level? I think that role's changing a lot, and especially in the next five to 10 years, it's gonna look vastly different than what it looks like today. For a long time, tech has been kind of this unregulated um, industry when it comes to this idea of transparency with the algorithm. They've been able to have their own algorithm, not really have to put it out there. That's gonna be changing soon, I think. I think Congress is now thinking about the mental health crisis and the links to social media companies, and what can they be doing? Does that mean Facebook now needs to put out their algorithm and show how they're actually lessening it? Um, or I don't know how many people have, um, I'm forgetting the name of it, the, the Netflix documentary that was about social media. Social dilemma. The social dilemma. I don't know how, people, how many people saw that, but how Facebook had this whole algorithm that was literally kind of these two different camps of like showing happy content versus sad content and testing on people. You know, I think it's as simple as understanding that if there's a test like that going on, that that needs to be disclosed. That's an FDA disclosure that should be made because it's literally a research project on people. And so I think things like that, that regulate social media so that if you're testing on people, if you're changing how people are thinking, if you're literally impacting millions, if not billions of people every single day, that you are held to a higher standard to actually look at that and not having it be un, as un, unregulated anymore. For how students can get involved in that, there's a lot of different ways. I think from even if, if you want to go in the tech route, from within the companies, it's understanding how can I go and work at this company but then change the culture of it, right? And talk about the things that can be done. It can be done from the policy side. There's a lot of different senators and Congress people right now working on issues to understand legislation, so drafting tech legislation. There's a lot of different student groups that are looking at this as well to understand how tech impacts every single day uh, lives of people that are Gen Z and different generations. So I think, Either grassroots organizations are great ways, getting involved in policies that already exist by going on, just like Googling it um, and looking up what pe who are, who's working on it, or even just starting to talk about it and doing your own research to see what's out there and what are the gaps and what we're not talking about yet. I wanna add into the action piece a little bit here. So over the last couple of years, half the story has been at a position where we have been able to bring our youth from around the United States into positions within the Congress, both statewide and, and nationally, to give you, the next generation, the voice and the platform on the stage that you should have. And so right now, because we're living in a world where there hasn't been a national legislation since 1998 that holds tech accountable, is we are fighting to have tech have the same protections that we have for cars and that we have for children's toys and that we have for food. And so there are actually two key policies that I'm actually going to Sacramento next week to bring a bunch of youth to. One is a social media harms bill that is ultimately going to get the state of California to be financially either accountable or incentivized, depends on what, day you, what way you look at it, to invest in building software and infrastructure and architecture that will reduce the amount of harms online. And the, sex, the second is actually around social media and sex trafficking. This is something we don't talk about, but over 55% of sex trafficking cases for minors happen on digital platforms. And there are virtually no systems in place within these platforms to prevent them from happening. So that's the second bill we're working on in California. And, and my ask to you is, if any of you wanna get involved, do you wanna write op-eds, do you wanna come testify at Congress, we have a youth policy group that we will educate you on all the policies and connect you to these opportunities. So you can find all of that at Half the Story, and I'd love for you to be the voices of the future. Thank you. And so we've kind of talked about different aspects of creating your presence online and taking action. So we talked about youth voices. We talked about how to not be overwhelmed yourself while doing it, what platforms to use, um, how to affect other people with your own personal story. And all this is great information to know when students or people in general are working to really make a difference. Um, I think the one biggest hurdle that people might have in this progress is how to make it big, how to do all of this and how to get someone to notice, how to make it so that it's on a large scale and you're achieving those big goals that you set for yourself. What's your advice on that? My argument for that is actually not to think about that, <laughs> which I know sounds weird, but um, I think if you go into it with thinking, of, oh, I'm gonna hit this number, you're gonna stress yourself out. You're automatically gonna burn out because you can't control the algorithm. Things are changing all the time. 
when I went into it, I kind of just thought, I want to put information out there. And if people like it, that's wonderful. I didn't know how big I wanted the community to be. I just knew I wanted a community. Um, and so it's, it just started off by like just posting things. And over time, it kind of grew. And now I kind of look, I'm like, oh, wow, that's actually kind of crazy to think about the numbers that there are. But I try not to focus on that, right? And so I think on TikTok, it's like 600,000 followers. On like Instagram, it's like 150,000. Um, and then others like in different places too. But the idea wasn't about building that building the numbers, it's about building a community. And some people can have amazing numbers, but have no community, right? The, the, what matters a lot is how are you speaking to people, how are you empowering them to be able to share their voices, and how do you get them involved in the vision that you're trying to share? I would also say, um, don't just look at the numbers, don't just try to become uh, another TikTok viral star. Um, there are, I know New York Times bestsellers that have less than 10,000 followers. I know millionaires that have 1,000 followers. Um, you don't need to be famous to make an impact. And I think that's an important uh, thing to take away. It can be so easy to be like, I mean, I have uh, the least amount of followers compared to y'all, and that's fine, but I think my impact has been um, s as impactful in certain uh, communities, like you said. Um, I have a, a community that's really engaged and focused uh, because of my content. Um, also, uh, a more strategic, uh, a, a strategic approach could be uh, approaching someone in your marketing department uh, at your college, and if you have some funding, um, partner with them uh, to make some strategic ads. Um, the power of a $20 boost uh, for post is really powerful. Um, you don't need a lot of money to uh, have a message spread. I love that point, and I, I will say half the story started with a $250 grant that I printed stickers from, from the Art Center at Vanderbilt's campus, and the one thing that youth can do that understand tech better than any other generation is spread a story like wildfire, and there are a couple ways that you can do that very tactically. One is create alliances with others that have platforms that are bigger, that are, are there to believe in you. You will never be, I mean, you might be, we're all students of life, but when you are in college, you have the ability to reach out to alumni and ask them for help and get them to help you share your story. So don't, don't forget the power of reaching out for help. The second is pitch yourself. I would send 100 pitches a day when I was a student. There is a platform called Cision, and you can find editors' emails from all around the world, and you can pitch your story, and you never know where that can take you. And it's free 99. All you have to do is put in a little bit of elbow grease. And then the third thing is, is focus on a local mentality. I think in the social media world, I see all of these kids that say, oh, I need to create a nonprofit, be a CEO by the age of 18 in order to make a difference. No, you don't. If you change one person's life, whether it's your roommate or your friend or your family or someone that you meet on the street, one small change every single day can change the world. And there were many times in my journey where we didn't have money for funding. No one took me seriously as a 22-year-old that said, the future of mental health is understanding technology. And it was really hard. But you know what I did? I leaned into the people around me and the places that I could make an impact with the resources that I had. And I feel so humbled to even be here today on this platform because this is just another step towards the future and the world that we want to build. And we all get to do it together. I really want to pick up on that piece that you talked about with storytelling. Because I think that's something that's under-talked about, especially on social media. But it's key to building any following is that story. Um, and I don't think we learn enough about how do we actually create stories. So one of my favorite books I've ever read that helped me with storytelling was called Made to Stick by Chip and Dan Heath. I don't know if people have read it, but incredible story. Uh, incredible book. Essentially, they use this um, acronym SUCCESS to describe how do you make a compelling story. The S in success stands for simple. The U is unexpected. The C, the first C, is concrete. The second C is credible. The E is emotional. And the last is story. And so if you have all those six different elements into anything, you can really grab people's attention. And with every video I make, I try and keep it very personal and use that model if it's kind of a storytelling model. So it's how does it, how does it, how do you get a simple idea? Healthcare, unfortunately, medicine can be complex to understand. How do you make it simple? How do you make it unexpected? So with the story I told you about GFR, it was unexpected in itself that most people probably didn't know that race was used, is actually still used today in medicine and equations like that. It's concrete because it impacts every single one of us here. It's credible because there's research. You can go to Google, you can see it in the New England Journal of Medicine and JAMA in every single different article. 
It's emotional because it has direct impacts on all of us and our loved ones. And it's a story because we all have that story that will impact us when we go to the hospital. So I think remembering those six different things, um, check out the book, it's really good. And I think creating content like that helps you bring people in to understand who you are as a person and how they can get involved in your own story. I, I also was just gonna say, this is very, very simple, but it works. End every story with a call to action and a question. So you'll spend 30 years of your life online, what would you do with that time back? Those are the types of ways that you can create authentic engagement and that story will fuel itself. Also, if you spend your time really stressing about the numbers or how many clicks you're gonna get, that takes away from the energy and creativity in, for the content. So many people stress out about that and you can utilize a lot of more energy with really um, intentional content versus thinking if this is gonna go viral or not. Yeah. And I'll say, I've posted content before like multiple times and I'll post it once, it'll get literally five million views. I post it again, it gets 5,000. <laughs> you know, it's not like different content. It was the same exact thing, same video. It was just the timing. And so really understanding that it's all about, like sometimes it's not about how great your content is, it's just about the time it's posted, what else is out there, and the algorithm that's out there. Thank you guys for your great answers and advice for our students. And so we're gonna actually turn it back to the audience and ask you guys to ask our speakers some questions. So there'll be from some microphones going around the room. Um, if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand. Just wait for the mic to come to you and we'll get to it. I see a hand over there. Hello, and, and this is actually just uh, more of a comment. I appreciated your point earlier about trying to define youth or what how we feel. And uh, about a month ago, I think it was in The Atlantic, uh, there was an article about the gap between the age we actually are on paper and how we feel within ourselves. The data showed that each of us feel about 20% younger inside than we actually are. And it then explored how that works in advertising, how that works in communication. If you know that someone is a certain age, but they feel a different way, how can you speak to that? It's just a quick comment. I appreciated your, your point about youth and just wanted to offer that. I love that. I think I feel like I'm 50% younger, but I like the 20%. <laughs> Do you have a question? Hello, thank you. Um, I actually have a question for Larissa. At the beginning, when you were talking about um, the idea for your project, you talked about how you realized that social media was only half of the story and how that was significant. But I don't think you ever touched upon the reasonings for you thinking so. Could you elaborate on that for a little bit? Absolutely. So technology is changing rapidly. And back when I started Half the Story, which I have a little pocket of the logo that my friend drew for me on Vanderbilt's campus, that was back in the era of perfect avocado toast. Do you all remember that era? It was, everyone was eating avocado toast. We had beautiful filters and it was, it was the filter era. It was uh, before the video era. And for me, in this moment of reflection, the other part of my story that you all don't know is that I was an entrepreneur, I had a fashion blog, I was building my own brand as a young person because I felt that that was a way that I could have the most powerful voice in the room at a young age when I went to a city like New York. And so on one hand, social media afforded me the opportunities to make money as a college student so I didn't have to get another job on campus and it gave me a personal position in the world. That was the power of it. The negative piece was everything I shared about before. And what I realized is that Social media was really a non-binary experience. We like to put things in categories of good or bad, black and white, yes or no, take it or leave it, cancel or not cancel. But I believed that in order to get to the root of social media, we had to move from a culture of connecting into a culture of connection. And that was through sharing the other side of the story. And so if you look back and you look at the half the story hashtag, you'll see young people from all over Vanderbilt's campus in the world that started with their own narratives, which fueled a, fu fueled a fire that I'm still trying to keep up with. So, <laughs> yes, thank you for asking. So my question is primarily for Joel, but like you guys can contribute as well. So uh, you probably like put out information about like medical stuff and all that, right? So I follow someone similar. You you might know him as well, Dr. Mike. So. He like sometimes upload videos about like myth busting TikTok videos and all that stuff, right? Medical stuff. So you guys talked about how you should be like about digital literacy and how you should be aware about the media you consume. But like while this sounds like good on paper and like even I like believe in it, some when I see like his videos and the 
like video he reacts to, I feel like if I saw that on TikTok, I would actually believe it because like the whole business model of all the social media is to like not have not having to do much work and just like getting dopamine hits, right? So if I'm bored by a video, I can just skip it and like I don't want to like put in the work. So if I see a video about someone posting a story about how you can like make like have better health, even though like he might not have the qualifications that is required to give that information out, right? I won't like even I won't like properly research and I might actually like believe in it. So like to counter it, we can say one thing would be like for the consumer to be aware about the media he's consuming, but this well sounds good on paper, it is like really more complicated than how it sounds and like so recently there was this whole saga on Twitter about like free speech and like they added something like fact checking on their like people's tweets so if it's mis misinformation the consumers can actually like point it out and like say that it's, it gets labeled as misinformation or something, right? So how do you guys think like it should be countered aside, countered aside from like the consumer actually being aware about it. So one thing I really like about is like the Twitter's initiative. So do you have something similar? Because if someone wears a like medical suit and like starts talking about stuff, I'll, people are gonna believe it, right? And n most of most people aren't gonna like research more into it. So yeah, there's three ways I think about it. I think from the company perspective, like you mentioned, they need to be doing things to actually say how do we make sure that we prevent the spread of misinformation and disinformation. So during the COVID pandemic, that's really where I started posting a lot, and I worked with the World Health Organization to look at actually putting together a group of influencers, doctors, who can actually post and fight against negative or incorrect information. So there's one, one aspect is the companies. How do you bring pe together people who know what they're talking about and are accurate, then how do you put tags on it, whether it's on Twitter saying, this, is, this actually is not true, um, which has been great, I think, especially since, like, Elon Musk, for example, tweeted something that was incorrect, and it corrected him, even though he owns Twitter. And that's really important to say, no matter how big your platform is, if you put information that's misleading or not true, we're going to hold you accountable. So, th th so that's one, uh, kind of companies. Two, I think for physicians, I always tell them, we should be on social media. One in seven people in the United States get their medical information from social media right now. That's TikTok, that's Instagram, that's Facebook, et cetera. And when doctors aren't in the place where people are getting their information, they're getting wrong information from other people who may be putting out, like you're saying, incorrect information that is harming people and their health. And so really, I think getting more physicians and people that are in the medical industry online fighting against it is really important. And doing it in a way that's not aggressive and counter to it, but adding on and supplementary. So if there's a video that's talking about kidney disease, really making sure that someone stitches it and says, actually, here's where they got it wrong, but here's where they get it right. And it's hard to do because that means there needs to be a lot of people out there. And then three, I think it's all of us. And I think we all have an individual responsibility to understand that information's put out there with a ulterior motive, right? And so to be a skeptic first whenever you're on social media, to understand that you can go online, you can look something up, and if something sounds really good and you think it might impact your life, look it up first. Don't just take that advice and start doing that trend or whatever they're saying, right? Speak to people who have trained for it, who understand it before you jump into it. I think those three things are really important. The company side, um, the individual side, and then also just the physician side. Uh, hello. My name is Victoria Di Francesco Soto. I'm the dean of the Clinton School. But my question is with my hat as a mom. So I have an eight and a nine-year-old. Uh, we've kept the phones away and the iPads to a minimum. So my question is for someone like me, a Gen Xer, where I'm, I'm looking about how to onboard my children into that, because it's inevitable. They are going to be in this new digital universe, but how do we curate an experience for these children? And also, what is the training that can be given to the parents to then impart that on that next generation of digital citizens. I was just gonna say, that's a commitment idea right there. Yeah. For anyone like that needs one. Um, I think it's, because I don't think there's enough organizations that do that, right? That are from students teaching parents how do you on people, onboard people into this new generation of ideas. And it's hard. Um, and so like things that I, like I know I'm gonna do it for my kids now, like I'm kinda in this, like limiting screen time, I think that what you're doing is great already understanding the landscape, you know, like 
asking them like, oh, what are you seeing right now? Or what are your friends seeing? Um, asking teachers what they're noticing in schools. Because I think that's a huge place where kids are talking about it, teachers are hearing about things that are happening, but not totally understanding it. Um, and so, so I think really asking your children, like, what kind of things are you watching right now? Or like, what accounts do you have? And they're not always gonna be honest with you. And so I think figuring out the latest trends is really important by keeping up on the news and things too. So for example, Be Real is like this new thing, which, how many people have heard of Be Real in this room? And then ask how many people's be reels are actually be real, okay? Yeah. Because I'm like up here with like triple chins under here, yeah. and I see these glam shots on be real. I'm like, what is going on? Yeah, I hate to say it though, but I definitely saw a generational divide when I asked who was on be real, even right now. And <laughs> but like that, those are like the the big places to understand like how are kids and people in our generation on, like jumping into these new social media and how are they used? And so I think honestly the best way is to ask questions about it um, and keep up to date on like recent news. Okay. Well, I'd like to jump in. First of all, on the parent side, from our organization perspective, we have youth at the forefront, but our delta and cha our delta of change requires the students, the admin, and the parents. So we work to shift ecosystems by educating each one of those touch points. So hopefully half the story can come to your kid's school. But outside of that, I, I want to challenge the story that society likes to tell parents and that the story that society likes to tell children. And that it is that all screen time is created equal. At half the story, we do not believe that all screen time is created equal. It is the easiest first degree messaging that our society holds onto as an indicator of our own health in relationship to technology. And so for as a parent, our methodology at Half the Story is actually very much, very much so rooted in play and positivity and thinking about instead of focusing on the deficit or taking phones away, how do we make that fun? How do you, how do you say, hey, kids, you know, we're going to actually all put our phones away today. We're going to give you Polaroid cameras and we're going to go do a scavenger hunt as a family and we're all going to put our phones away and have some sort of adventure or experience. Um, but then the second piece of that is I think parents always come to us asking what to do to, for their kids and it starts with your own relationship and it starts with your ability to be vulnerable and foster conversations about how technology impacts you so that you can set that, that model for your kids. And then the third piece is create boundaries that are empowering for your kids. The number one thing we hear is we wish our parents created more boundaries. And um, as a parent, you never think your kid wants that, but they need that. And so what we like to say is, you know, always have a dedicated space every single day where your entire family is screen fee free. Replace TV and screens before bed with a family book or learning to play a new game. These analog activities, which are critical not only for connection, but also for neuroplasticity and cognitive development. And you don't want your kid's brain health to be behind because they're behind their device. And that's the conversation that I think we need to have. So we should talk later and would love to support in any way. Um, I don't have, I'll just jump in real quick. I don't have any kids, but um, I have some anecdotal evidence from friends who do. Um, a lot of them ask their kids how they're feeling. A lot of people, a lot of kids in that age like are so quick to, um, compare themselves to what they're seeing online. So if they're watching someone, my niece likes to uh, watch YouTube videos of people eating or something like that, I have no idea. But um, they have asked their kids like, hey, how are you feeling or noticing behavioral changes? Are, you, are they a bit more uh, self-judgmental uh, or are they acting out more? That could be coming from the content that they're watching. Um, and I think just as I talked about earlier, having uh, watching content that is inspiring, encouraging, kind of like you would watch on TV, uh, making sure that encouraging them to have similar practices on YouTube or social media. Hello, panelists. Um, I first just wanted to say thank you all so much for dedicating your time here. You all articulated your story so incredibly beautifully, and I think everybody here is gonna leave so much more inspired and knowledgeable about this topic. Um, but something that I wanted to ask was, I think it's fair to say that like on this campus or any campus, most if not all people have something that they're passionate about, have something that they're like, yes, I wanna advocate for this, but very few people kind of translate that into, okay, let me contact lawmakers, let me show up at the Capitol building, that kind of thing. So I guess I wanted to ask um, either in terms of your personal experiences or maybe advice you would have for change makers like us, how do we bridge that gap between a belief and like actual tangible action that we take. And like, I guess just how an individual like us would be able to make that big step. 
I think it's an amazing question. Um, and it's something like I think about a lot because when I first came into this space and like talking about health equity, I was lost. I was like, I know I'm passionate about this. I wanna talk about it. I wanna put these issues out there for everyone to hear about, but how do I actually take it to the next level and make systemic change? To make change to the entire systems that are actually causing these things to happen. Um, and some of the ways I started going about it was one, finding people who had organizations that were working on policies and joining those. So one of the first I joined was the Institute for Healing and Justice. It was a group of medical students and residents um, and physicians that were kind of far out of their practice. They were looking at all these different places and we started putting together white papers, policy briefs that we could actually send over to a congressman and woman or to the American Medical Association. I joined the American Medical Association, was able to draft legislation about things like, let's make racism a public health crisis, or how do we um, talk about the Crown Act um, to make sure we protect black women's hair so that's not discriminatory in hospital settings or just in, in general, anywhere. And those were kind of the first steps I took was just figuring out how do I create policy, write things down, join organizations, and meet other people who've been doing this work already, but bringing my kind of unique lens to it using social media to it. So that's why I would suggest for everyone here is when you start getting plugged into whatever your passion is, start finding those organizations that are doing the work. Because there's probably someone out there, right? And if they're not out there, bring together other people that are sharing a similar ideal to you put that group together and start finding out who are the, the, the stakeholders in this area that I can start to put pressure on or create or talk about. And that's really the power of social media, I think, is being able to kind of have this like outside perspective of coming in and being able to pressure things from the outside. And so I, I talked about a little bit about the GFR equation, but another one really quickly is the pulse oximeter. How many people have heard about kind of the pulse oximeter disparity? Okay, so not many people. Um, but essentially, pulse oximeters are these, these devices that go on your finger. They measure how much blood oxygen saturation there is in your body. But unfortunately, darker skin tones because of melanin can overestimate the reading on this device. Meaning that if you have darker skin and you come in and you're short of breath and you actually don't have much oxygen, you have a higher likelihood, a three times uh, higher likelihood than someone with lighter skin of incorrectly having it read on your, on, on your body. That had clinical significance for COVID. People were not given supplemental oxygen because of it. They were sent home when they actually had difficulty breathing. And studies have shown that more people died that were black and brown because this pulse oximeter didn't work well. I heard about that story in December 2020, posted a video on it. It got half a million views within 24 hours. Um, but then I was like, how do I take this next step? So I ended up speaking at the FDA to talk about why is this significant as a medical student. I started writing articles about it for like NPR um, and for like different, different op-ed pieces. And then people started coming to me kind of and saying, how can we jump, get you on board with joining the White House Council for Social Media Leaders um, or joining the World Health Organization and things like that. And so it really stems from kind of that interplay of reaching out, putting your story out there, letting people know what you're doing, and people will start coming to you afterwards as well. I think people are asking that same question at all scales. Um, we're talking, Google's asking that question, we're asking that question here. I think that not everyone is meant to be a social media content creator. And that's just the reality of it. Some people are made to be uh, a graphic designer or a marketer or a strategist. Um, and I think that you can develop a team where people can play to their strengths to help you communicate your story and your message a lot stronger. Um, you don't have to show up and be a medical educator or uh, show up shirtless to show your journey um, to make an impact. And I think that remembering that, okay, I don't need to be a TikTok star in order to uh, make the big change that you're asking is a super important thing to remember. I think we have time for one more quick question. Hi, my name is uh, Rachel George. I'm a junior at UAB, University of Alabama at Birmingham. Um, my CGIU partner and I, we serve as research assistants in a lab focused on transportation safety in the Southeast, and that helped inspire our CTA project, which is about micromobility safety. Um, so we utilize TikTok and Instagram to sort of help spread the word about transportation safety, UAB, Trip Lab, if anyone's interested um, in our work. Um, and it can get a little overwhelming sometimes just trying to figure out how to plan content and put it into non-technical language. What are some specific tools that y'all use to help organize, plan, and schedule your content? Go ahead. So I'm very, like, I'm weird when I'm off the cuff with my content because I feel like my problem is I have so much I want to talk about and not enough time. Um, and so it's, it's a lot about, like, how do I plan it out. But the first thing I do, write down every single idea. I have a OneNote notebook with probably like 500 ideas in there right now. Um, I've also gotten very much into using ChatGPT. Do people use that? Oh, yeah. It's brilliant for video ideas. Amazing. And I've realized you could actually write into it, take this, like I literally will take my idea and say, take this idea and create, a, I literally write, create a 30-second script about this idea. 
whatever it is, and I write it, and it writes it for you. Or I can say, take this script and make sure it's written at a second grade reading level, and it'll do it for me. So that's been huge for me, and I've only done this in like the past few weeks, but it saved so much time. It's helped with translating technical language. It's chat, chat GPT. Yeah, chat GPT. We, um, we just uh, constructed an offer letter based on chat GPT. Yeah, it's, so if people, don't have, people haven't used it, definitely use it, it's really helpful. Um, and obviously second check and everything, but I think writing down all your ideas, I use my calendar, so I write it out there. Um, I use ChatGPT now to like make the scripts. Um, I write my scripts beforehand and read them out, that way I can stay on language that is accurate. Um, do you think what else I use? I use Canva for like graphics and things. Um, yeah. In terms of scheduling, there are great platforms like Planoly as well as Hootsuite. I'm not sure if you've tinkered with any of those before, but I, I do think the idea of pre-batching your content as a thought leader is critical. As a CEO, I, I mean, luckily I have my research team who's always feeding me things, Rachel over here, and it's it's critical because I can't be spending three hours a day making a video when I have to raise money and actually run a business. So I would batch your content, find a platform that works, and budget for a significant amount of time each week so that you can create content that's relevant and timely and speaks to what's happening in the here and now. And also not all your content needs to be long form. Yeah. Uh, some viral content are 10 seconds. Yeah, and the other thing you can um, look at like, just trends that are going on. So <laughs> I made a video yesterday that was like the Rihanna dance because uh, everyone was trending on that right now from the Super Bowl. Um, but little things like, and make it fun too. You know, it doesn't always have to be on like your brand. Um, there's things called evergreen content. Those are things that can be posted anytime. There's posts that are more like, okay, and this is a moment to take it. Um, and I think just like playing around too. You can play around with content, which is great. Thank you all for being here with us today and for having such great questions for our speakers and listening so intently. Um, that does conclude our speaker session, um, but I hope you have a great rest of your time at CGIU, and thank you so much for joining us. I guess one, one last thing. Can we just really go quickly and find where, we can, where they can find us? Yes. At Half the Story, at Living Like Lars. Mine's at Joelle Burvell, so just my name. At Abe Lopez, like my name. Thank you. Thank you all.